I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome. This story is being brought to you by William Jevning and is being narrated by Jim Sower. This is the Ruby Creek story. Stories about the Sasquatch have been appearing in print from time to time since the 1860s, and I have clippings in my files from almost every year since the early 1920s. But the modern history of the Sasquatch really dates from September 1941, when one of these creatures paid a visit, in broad daylight, to an Indian family named Chapman. While the Amerindian stories have usually been dismissed as legend, or laughed off because uh, they're not supposed to be reliable, this experience was accompanied by too much physical evidence to be ignored. The Chapman family consisted of George and Jeannie Chapman, and children numbering, at my visit, four. Mr. Chapman worked on the railroad and was living at that time in a small place called Ruby Creek, 30 miles up the Fraser River from Agassiz, British Columbia, in Canada's Great Western Province. It was about three in the afternoon of a sunny, cloudless day when Jeannie Chapman's eldest son, then age nine, came running to the house saying that there was a cow coming down out of the woods at the foot of the nearby mountain. The other kids, a boy age seven and a little girl of five, were still playing in a field behind the house bordering on the rail track. Miss Chapman went out to look. Since the boy seemed oddly disturbed, and they saw what at first she thought was a very big bear moving about among the bushes bordering on the field beyond the railway tracks, she called the two children, who came running immediately. Then the creature moved on to the tracks, and she saw, to her horror, that it was a gigantic man covered with hair, not fur. The hair seemed to be about four inches long all over, and of a pale yellow-brown color. To pin down this color, Mrs. Chapman pointed out to me a sheet of lightly varnished plywood in the room where we were sitting. This was of a brown okra color. This creature advanced directly towards the house, and Mrs. Chapman had, as she put it, much too much time to look at it, because she stood her ground outside while the eldest boy, on her instructions, got a blanket from the house and rounded up the other children. The kids were in a near panic, she told us, and it took two or three minutes to get the blanket, during which time the creature had reached the near corner of the field only about one hundred feet away from her. Mrs. Chapman then spread the blanket and, holding it aloft so the kids could not see the creature, or it them, she backed off at the double to the old field and down onto the river beach out of sight, and then ran with the kids downstream to the village. I asked her a leading question about the blanket. Had her purpose in using it been to prevent her kids seeing the creature, in accordance with an alleged Amerindian belief that to do so brings bad luck and often death? Her reply was both prompt and surprising. She said that, Although she had heard white men tell of that belief, she had not heard it from her parents or any other of her people whose advice regarding the so-called Sasquatch had been simply not to go further than certain points up certain valleys, to run if she saw one, and not to struggle if one caught her as it might squeeze her to death by mistake. No, she said. I used the blanket because I thought it was after one of the kids, and so might go into the house to look for them instead of following me. This seems to have been sound logic, as the creature did go into the house, and also rummaged through an old outhouse pretty thoroughly, hauling from it a 55-gallon barrel of salt fish, 
breaking this open and scattering its contents about outside. The irony of it is that all three children did die within three years. The two boys by drowning and the little girl on a sick bed. And just after I interviewed the Chapmans, they also were drowned in the Fraser River when a rowboat capsized. Mrs. Chapman told me that the creature was about seven and a half feet tall. She could estimate its height by the various fence and line posts standing about the field. It had a rather small head and a very short, thick neck. In fact, really, no neck at all, a point that was emphasized by William Rowe and by all others who claimed to have seen one of these creatures. Its body was entirely human in shape, except that it was immensely thick through its chest, and its arms were exceptionally long. She did not see the feet, which were in the grass. Its shoulders were very wide, and it had no breasts, from which Mrs. Chapman assumed it was a male, though she did not see any male genitalia due to the long hair covering its groin. She was most definite on one point. The naked parts of its face and its hands were much darker than its hair, and appeared to be almost black. George Chapman returned home from his work on the railroad that day shortly before six in the evening, and by a route that bypassed the village, so that he saw no one to tell him what had happened. When he reached his house, he immediately saw the woodshed door battered in, and spotted enormous humanoid footprints all over the place. Greatly alarmed, for he, like all of his people, had heard since childhood about the big wild men of the mountains, though he did not hear the word Sasquatch till after this incident. He called for his family, and then dashed through the house. Then he spotted the foot tracks of his wife and kids going off toward the river. He followed these until he picked them up on the sand beside the river and saw them going off downstream without any giant ones following. Somewhat relieved, he was retracing his steps when he stumbled across the giant's foot tracks on the river bank farther upstream. These had come down out of the potato patch, which lay between the house and the river, had milled about by the river, and then gone back through the old field toward the foot of the mountains, where they disappeared in the heavy growth. Returning to the house, relieved to know that the tracks of all four of his children and family had gone off downstream to the village, George Chapman went to examine the woodshed. In our interview after eighteen years, he still expressed voluble astonishment that any living thing, even a seven-foot-six-inch man with the barrel chest, could lift a fifty-five-gallon tub of fish and break it open without using a tool. He confirmed the creature's height after finding a number of long brown hairs stuck in the slabwood lintel of the doorway above the level of his head. George Chapman then went off to the village to look for his family, and found them in a state of calm collapse. He gathered them up and invited his father-in-law and two others to return with him for protection of his family when he was away at work. The foot tracks returned every night for a week and on two occasions the dogs that the Chapmans had taken with them set up the most awful racket at exactly two o'clock in the morning. The Sasquatch did not, however, molest them or apparently touch either the house or the woodshed. But the whole business was too unnerving, and the family finally moved out. They never went back. After a long chat about this and other matters, Mrs. Chapman suddenly told us something very significant, just as we were leaving. She said, It made an awful funny noise. I asked her if she could imitate this noise for me, but it was her husband who did so, saying that he had heard it at night twice during the week, after the first incident. He then proceeded to utter exactly the same strange, gurgling whistle that the men in California who said they had heard a Bigfoot call, had given us. This is a sound I cannot reproduce in print, but I can assure you that it is unlike anything I have ever heard given by man or beast anywhere in the world. To me this information is of greatest significance. 
that an Amerindian couple in British Columbia should give out with exactly the same strange sound in connection with the Sasquatch that two highly educated white men did over 600 miles south in connection with California's Bigfoot is incredible. If this is all hoax or a publicity stunt or a mass hallucination, as some people have claimed, how does it happen that this noise, which defies description, always sounds the same no matter who has tried to reproduce it for me? These were probably the last words on the Sasquatch that the Chapmans uttered, and I absolutely refused to listen to anybody who might say that they were lying. Admittedly, honest men are such a rarity as possibly to be non-existent, but I have met a few who could qualify, and I put the Chapmans near the head of that list. This story was written by Ivan T. Sanderson in True Magazine, March 1960. This concludes the reading of Ruby Creek. Thank you for listening. In Bigfoot History, near Ridgefield, Washington, early July 1963, Mr. and Mrs. Martin Henrich, Portland, fishing on Lewis River, saw what they assumed was a tree trunk near the bank suddenly walk into a thicket. It was beige in color and bigger than a human. Mrs. Henrich told her story to the Oregon Journal, and as a result, Jim Arian, son of Charles Arian, who had a farm nearby, went looking for tracks. He found 16-inch prints leading in and out of the river on the south bank near the railway bridge. I saw some of these when they were several weeks old and made a cast. <laughs> Welcome. This written story is being brought to you by William Jevning and is narrated by Jim Sower. The following was written by Dr. H. A. Miller, who died in 2005. Born in New England, December 12, 1909. I was the first and only child of Christiana and Arthur Miller. My mother died in childbirth and I was subsequently raised by my father until remarried to a Frenchwoman when I was twelve or thirteen years of age. Soon after their marriage, she bore a baby girl. I finished my high school education while living with my father, stepmother, and half-sister. I remained in New England for my undergraduate work. I thoroughly enjoyed the outdoors, the ocean, and forestry. My undergraduate studies focused on forestry and land management. While in my junior and senior year, I was employed by the federal government. I worked at Lockwood Farm, part of the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. I learned about hybridization and agriculture and enjoyed the hard outdoor work in the cornfields. I began to find great interest in the scientific workings happening with corn seed at the time. I completed an additional year in forestry science and graduated in 1930 with an A.B. from Yale University and an M.F. Mastery of Science in Forestry in 1931. I labored at Lockwood Farm for a few years and gained great interest in science and medicine. By this time, I did hope to attend medical school and become a physician. I expeditiously applied for medical school and was accepted to Harvard and began my medical training in 1938. Graduating from Harvard Medical School in the early 1940s, and I completed residency and fellowship at Harvard and began a very specialized career at the time in orthopedic forensic surgery, Massachusetts General Hospital, MGH, in Boston. Because of my previous work with the USDA, I was quickly employed by the federal government. My early years as a physician related mostly to providing medical support to various employee types, firefighters, etc., within the USDA slash FS. I also became the forensic expert and anatomist for the USDA and was called to examine most major accidental deaths of USDA FS servicemen. 
Due to my interest in genetics and early experiences in agricultural hybridization, I was assigned to scientific teams which investigated the physical nature of genetics. Our early experiments determined that DNA is the component of the chromosomes where genetics should be studied. This, along with the efforts of several other scientists, led to the discovery of the double helix structure in the early 1950s. It was at this time that several of our team members were called to Bandera County, Texas, where the forestry scientists, biologists assigned to Edwards Plateau, reported the dead bodies of a strange type of human. The first reports I received were speculating that they were feral humans from the local Comanche Indian tribes. The bodies were supposedly found in or around one of the massive caves within the Edwards Plateau area. When I arrived in Texas, I was surprised to find three bodies, one adult female and two female juveniles. I examined them, as I typically would any human subject, but to my dismay, one of the creatures still seemed to be alive. I became quite upset with the local scientists, but they reassured me that they confirmed all three were deceased. After further investigation... I found that these creatures were not human. They, in fact, had a remarkable rapid reparative process, hence the reason one of the creatures seemed dead, but in fact was regenerating to some degree. Unfortunately, the restorative abilities of the creature were not enough to keep it alive. They were massive in size and distinctly a new primate species unknown to science at the time. I spent years studying these creatures, which are scientifically known as Cibidetelidae, confirming that they were most certainly not human. They were definitely of primate origin, but with traits seen in various species of primate, most of which were New World monkey. Cibidetelidae found in the San Antonio, Texas area very much howl like a howler monkey, quite frightening to hear at night. At one point early in my analysis, I found a great deal of similarity between these Bigfoot creatures and the Howler monkey. That was until 1962. In late 1962, early 63, I was notified of a large, human-like creature by the Reading Forest Service folks in California. I arranged for transport of the body to my primary location in Colorado. It was reported to me that the body was found under a large tree that had been violently struck by lightning and blown to the ground, apparently killing this large creature. During my investigation, I found the animal to be very similar to those that I had studied in Bandera County area of Texas, with some marked differences. This northern version of Cibidetelidae seemed to have the same New World monkey attributes that I noted in the Texas animals known today as Cibidetelde texicanus, or C. texicanus. However, there were unique traits found in the Pacific Northwest animal, known today as Cibidetelde nerteros pacificus, or C. nerteros pacificus, including thumbs that are not entirely opposable, as we see in modern humans. C. nerteros pacificus' entire hand was truly designated for grip, including proximal pads, making the hand somewhat hooked-like, having flattened nails resulting in my theory that these northern creatures developed an evolutionary arboreal nature, while the Texas subfamily developed a troglocene nature. The Pacific Northwest, the NW, creature, found in 1962-63, also had scent glands on her forearms. This is more evidence that C. nerteros pacificus is arboreal to some extent, leaving scent marks up and down the tree while climbing. Not only was this creature smashed by the large tree, but she was also badly burned with areas of lightning prints on exposed skin. I notated in my medical examination report of the body that it seemed as though lightning struck the animal passing through the body and into the tree subsequently weakening the tree and causing it to fall to the ground. It did seem as though the animal had fallen to the ground first, with the tree falling on top of her afterward, but the evidence as to whether the animal fell first or with the tree is inconclusive. 
However, it is clear lightning struck the tree at a decent height of over twenty feet. Therefore, this animal must have been clinging to the tree at the time of the lightning strike. More evidence of the arboreal nature of C. nerteros pacificus. C. nerteros pacificus also has additional medial padding on the feet, which it would use to climb trees by clinging to the trees with its hands and support its weight. Both the C. nerteros pacificus and C. dexacanus have oversized lower jaws. Both the C. nerteros pacificus and C. dexacanus have oversized lower jaws, including massive sternocleidmastoid musculature. This must have been due to their rugged diet, and moreover, their need to crush bones. Their lower dentum at first looked as a second row of molars, but after years of research and examining the dead bodies of these animals, I have found that the lower molars are simply oversized and fused, resulting in massive bone-crushing tools. Due to their jaw size and bone-crushing dentum, it is also clear that all subfamily of this creature are omnivorous, predaceous, and opportunistic. We did find that the female killed during the Columbus Day storm was pregnant with monozygotic embryos. All female Cibidatellidae bodies I have investigated throughout my career that have been pregnant have monozygotic embryos. This again incorporating additional evidence of a new world monkey relationship. Due to my investigation of the 1950s bodies in Texas, the 1960s Pacific Northwest Columbus Day storm body, I submitted to the Department of Agriculture that this is a new Platyrrhini species and that a new family under the PARV order should be created. Fellow scientists of mine disagreed, given the fact that the creatures were examined in both cases were obviously bipedal and catarini in terms of their nostrils, facing downward, old-world monkeys. However, the juveniles that we have examined are much more platyrrhini in terms of nostril breadth and position. I won the debate in the end due to the fact that no evidence thus far demonstrates that these creatures crossed over from the old world, but are simply new world monkeys adapting to their various staged areas within North and South America. I have since retired, and I know of some new University of Utah and Idaho-based scientists who understand the genetics a bit better. Their findings are only supporting my original theorems, or at least I am told. These molecular biologists will soon understand the similarities with humans once the Human Genome Project is completed. As a result, I still revert to the Sasquatch species as Cibidatellidae with the following subfamilies. Cibidatellidae arctos, Cibidatellidae nerteros pacificus, Cibidatellidae somphos, Cibidatellidae americanus, Cibidatellidae texicanus, and Cibidatellidae amazonia. Any of these species found outside the New World must have originated from and migrated out of the New World. All of my experience with this primate has been post-mortem, save a few unique experiences in the wild. To my knowledge, a live specimen has never been captured except for once in Northern Research Station in California. However, the animal did not survive in captivity and died after only several days. I, of course, examined the body. There were many rumors that this captured Sasquatch was somehow magical and could shapeshift, and that is why it couldn't be found. The truth is, the folks at Northern Research Station were very devastated and embarrassed that this live specimen died so quickly after being in captivity. So no... They are not magical. They are highly intelligent primates. Having one die in captivity is a very difficult thing to watch due to the human nature and feeling about the species. In reality, captivity will never be realistic for Subiditellidae because of their size and complex brains. Similar to captive white sharks, the species cannot thrive in captivity and quickly die as a protective mechanism. I've spent a great deal of my career as an expert for the federal government concerning Cibidatellidae and throughout the world, including the bodies recovered in the 1980s due to Mount St. Helens' eruption. 
We made many recommendations to protect the species, but the DOI has constant concern regarding the impact of such a decision due to the vast number of areas this species inhabits. Such a decision would have potential negative impacts on the natural resource industry. The USFS is now working more toward creating protective wildlife refuges for Cibidetelidae. Others on the team focused on molecular genetics. The USFS and the DOI is recognizing now that the natural resource industry is not the economic center as it once was. So a final decision has been made to finalize the Class I identification of the species. There is a 20-year plan to incorporate all wildlife protection areas throughout many areas of the United States to ensure federal land protection for Cibidetelidae, starting with California, Colorado, Idaho, Oregon, Utah, and Washington. I was upset by this decision because the first location the species was identified scientifically was Texas. I petitioned, and as a result, the Government Canyon State Natural Area will be protected, opened to the public, and expanded in Bexar County, Texas. The long-term plan will be to open each of these designated natural areas to the public. Once all of the designated Cibatitelidae natural areas are open to the public, the Department of Interior will announce the species as an endangered New World primate. I am not sure if this will happen, and the Government Canyon State Natural Area will not be open to the public until 2005, and then expanded later in 2009, and then again in 2012. This will all be happening long after I'm dead, I'm afraid. I am currently still living in Colorado, and I have attempted to journal my experience with the discovery of this new massive primate. The species is amazing, powerful, and deadly if angered. Like any animal, it will protect itself, its food source, and its young at all cost. Artiodactyla, or hooved animals, are Cibidetelidae's primary food source. It is imperative that the federal government continue to designate natural areas. Otherwise, a scarce food resource available to Cibidetelidae will result in more opportunistic feeding behavior and closer interaction between humans and Cibidetelidae. These creatures and human beings simply do not coexist. This was written by H. A. Miller, M.D., Ph.D. He was influenced by the writings of anatomist Dr. Thomas Dwight, among which includes Frozen Sections of a Child, 1872, Clinical Atlas of Variations of the Bones of the Hands and Feet, 1907, and Thoughts of a Catholic Anatomist, 1911. This concludes the reading of Dr. H. A. Miller. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then... Keep your eyes open now.